This is Old Moor Wetland in the heart of the Dern Valley. It's bordered by the River Dern itself and among other things acts as a flood defence system for the surrounding low-lying land. But this is the story of a dramatic transformation. The reclamation of the Manvers Main Colliery coal storage yards and coking plant to become a wetland nature reserve and one of the finest in the north of England. Such was the importance of the Manvers Main Colliery in the Second World War, it was protected from enemy bombers by a squadron of barrage balloons, and two years' supply of coal was stored on nearby farmland in case the mine was bombed. This practice continued after the war. After the colliery closed in 1990, Wath Manvers had the dubious distinction of being the largest single area of derelict land in Europe. Much of the site was heavily contaminated by toxic by-products of coal. At its centre was the Manvers main colliery complex. Next to it lay a vast coking plant. West of that were the marshalling yards and 36 miles of track. 5,000 coal wagons from nearby mines were sorted daily and dispatched to all parts of the country. Before the mine shafts were sunk, this was farmland, and an 18th century farmhouse still stands on the site. Nearby was a stretch of water named Wath Ings. Despite its proximity to the Manvers Colliery, this had been a local nature and bird watching site for many years. The Ings was formed in the 1920s when a mine shaft collapsed and caused the ground to sink and then fill up with water. There are similar features at nearby Wumwell and Broomhill. The old farmhouse and outbuildings are now part of a thriving commercial and residential area. They are the administrative hub of a 250-acre wetland nature reserve run by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, usually known as the RSPB. We'll now begin telling you how this massive transformation came about. The story really begins in 1990, when the officers at Barnsley and Rotherham Councils were discussing the reclamation of the Wathmanvers site, which fell across both boundaries, so it gave them a big problem. Roger Mitchell of Rotherham Council floated the visionary idea of getting the soil from Old Moor, while at the same time creating a new wetland. But making this vision happen required a lot of imagination, courage and perseverance from Roger and his Barnsley colleague Eric Bennett. Eric managed the project from the Barnsley side and was responsible for the planning and design of Old Moor and overseeing its construction. Achieving the vision also required a lot of money, far beyond the reach of the local authorities. At about this time, the Dern Valley Partnership was formed, a new way of local authorities working with the private sector, government agencies and communities. In 1991, the partnership was successful in bidding for City Challenge funding, a new government initiative to regenerate and run down areas. A vital component of its five-year plan was the reclamation of the Wath Manvers site for housing and commercial use. Also, a new nature reserve at Old Moor was planned. Besides City Challenge, another important source of funding was a new European programme targeted at coalfield areas. Barnsley Council had played a prominent role in lobbying for this. After extensive surveys, other preparatory work and land acquisition, construction began in 1995 with funding from the City Challenge, other UK government funds and from Europe. It was always intended that the reserve would be run by a trust, but finding one was not easy. 
the Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust withdrew in 1994 and the RSPB turned down the opportunity in 1997. Word got around about this exciting new development and at its unofficial opening in September 1998, 1,500 people toured the site. The official opening was in 1999 and the RSPB took over the reserve in 2003. Oldmore Wetland lies between Barnsley and Rotherham in a semi-urban setting. A stone's throw away from a busy new business park and near to the built-up area known as Brampton, Wath-on-Dern and Bolton-on-Dern. Not the most promising location, you might think, for a nature reserve. But once visitors go through the gates of Old Moor, they enter a different world, one that is quiet, calm, with open water, islands and wader scrapes. Wet grassland, meadows, and woodland. A world that is a rich ecosystem, abundant with wildlife. Oldmoor is a birdwatcher's paradise, as you might expect from one of the RSPB's flagship reserves in the north of England. Everything has been done to encourage as many species of birds as possible. For example, the reserve has been carefully designed so that visitors don't disturb them. Take this hide for example. It allows visitors to see the birds without the birds being able to see them. There are seven more around the reserve looking out over the open water and the reed beds. And these well-maintained paths are screened from the water by steep banks which hide the people using them. Reed beds are managed to provide a mix of open water, wet reed and drier fen hedges. New channels and pools are being created to help bitterns forage for food. Bitterns are a great success story at Old Moor and other RSPB reservations. They're shy birds, more likely to be heard than be seen The booming voice of a male can be heard for miles. Reed beds were laid down to attract them and in 2012 bitterns nested at the Old Moor site for the first time. The water levels are carefully regulated. In spring they're lowered to reveal the mud which wader chicks need in order to feed. In the winter they're raised to encourage wildfowl. The grassland gets graced to the right height and thickness to retain moisture, which is great for insects and larvae, and also for the birds who feed on them. Oldmoor's varied habitats attract a wide variety of birds, in addition to the resident species. Thousands of other birds use it as a feeding stop on their migrations. Here's a list of what's been recorded so far today. It adds up to 27 different species, which is pretty impressive if you ask me. At different times of year, out on the water or resting in the reeds or on the banks, you will find ducks, geese, gulls and swans. You will see waders, birds of prey and numerous finches, tits and other small birds. Apart from bitterns, the cultivation of the reed beds has brought another rare breeding species. The bearded tit. Among the many species of duck to be found at Oldmoor are widgeon, golden eye, and the very rare pintail. Nesting boxes have helped to establish a colony of the uncommon tree sparrow, though recently they've gone missing. 
The feeding tables overlook from the visitor centre are constantly visited by finches, tits and other small birds, except when you want to film them, of course. If you go into the visitor centre at Old Moor, you will immediately meet RSPB volunteers. They are receptionists, guides and advisors. They work to maintain the site and its habitats and to record birds and other wildlife. All the RSPB reserves depend on volunteers who are all local people who support the RSPB's work on behalf of nature. Volunteers make a vital contribution, though this is often overlooked. So, I spoke to a couple of them to find out what their efforts entailed. It's a nice day out here and nice to come to a place like this. I can see why you volunteer, but why don't you give me your story of the volunteering? What do you do? Um, so I volunteer a lot with the visitor side of it. Um, so I volunteer um, welcoming guests, visitors to the reserve. I also volunteer in the shops. Um, so, um, and it's just great just to talk to people and talk, talk to them about nature and what's on the reserve and introduce them to Old Moor on the front desk, welcoming people to the reserve. Or um, I can be out um, actually on the reserve helping families with their po what they're doing on the reserve. So this could be pond dipping, this could be bird watching. Um, so any activities that they need help. Is it the same with UK? Because you're here under slightly different circumstances, aren't you? Yeah, it's a bit different. So I work mostly with the wardening team. And a lot of the work that I do is sort of the hands-on habitat management. So I'll be out in the reserve uh, tackling different different areas and then I do also help out a bit on the visitor side but mostly on uh, what we call community engagement and you'll have sort of little trails going through the reserve where we um, have activities planned for and of course visitors. they need somebody from here to go with them don't they mm. yeah um, is it a tiring sort of job um, for me it's it's physically tiring because it is really physical type of work, but I get a lot of satisfaction out of it, so, so it's good. So, uh, it's called Old Moor. What do you think the future is like for it? Has it got a future as a nature reserve? Definitely. It's, yeah. it's so um, it's so popular with visitors and everybody that comes, the birders love it and there's lots of work going on um, to maintain the habitats that are here yeah. um, to, so we, and we're getting more and more coming yeah. into the reserve. Exactly and that's another point isn't it because the more people come the more humans intrude on a place that let's, I think it's an SSI now isn't it special okay. scientific interest yeah. uh, yep. the, the more it may be threatened even even by somebody who's not meaning to threaten it how are you going to get over that uh, so what we do is we just sort of have places that are set aside for nature so even when you come to this reserve yeah, you'll, you'll uh, find you yeah, can't off go limits. <laughs> yeah there's specific parts where you can go and there's wonderful bird hides which you can go sit in but those hides, as the name suggests, it sort of keeps that little bit of separation between people and nature. From talking to Kay and Sarah, it was clear that visitors to the site played a big part in what they do. Lydia Taig is the Visitor Operations Manager for Old Moor and can tell us more about how visitors are attracted to the site and what sort of experience the RSPB hopes to give them. Well, I think especially over this last 16, 17 months or so, you know, the need for green space and, and the value of green space has become really obvious to a lot of our visitors. So having this amazing place, this natural place on so many people's doorstep is, has been a real godsend, I think, for a lot of people. So, yeah, I think um, having, having this resource for local people is, is really, really wonderful. But obviously it's not just local people that visit us here at Old Moor. We do get people from across the country and it is the wildlife spectacle that we have here that really attracts people. Indeed. You, sorry. No, no, it's quite all right. Um, from the booming bittern in the spring through to the feeding flights and the juveniles that we see at this time of year in, in, in mid and late summer through to the 
starling murmurations in the winter months. It really is. It's a it's a wonderful little site in such a urban suburban area. It really is a, a, a gem. <laughs> I suppose we could say that it's a big place. It's got wonderful things. It's got things that other other sort of areas like this haven't got. But how do you go about telling people? Look, you're here. <laughs> so the age-old uh, question of marketing, you know, 50% of your marketing budget is effective. The, the question is which half, you know. Um, so, yeah, we use, I mean, word of mouth is still the most powerful tool in, to, in terms of getting our messaging out there. So, of course, making sure that the visitor experience is right is a really important part of people telling their friends they should come. Um, but also we do use some traditional routes to media. We, you know, regular media releases that we'll put out to try and... Um, entice, entice the people in, yeah, exactly. Um, and of Been course, there, done that yeah, myself. <laughs> uh, and of course, the newer, those newer routes to market things like social media, Facebook mm. is really important for yeah. us, and and that kind of and Twitter, of course, is is, is really important for us as, as tools to get to to new audiences, particularly the family audience. Actually. Yeah, which mm. seems to be important here because we do see a lot of children here, yeah. and sometimes for children, however good it might be. 10, 15 minutes is enough, isn't it? <laughs> it's just birds flying about. Well, this is it. I think connecting children to nature is one of the RSPBs and actually my a personal passion of mine, but it's one of our really key mm. objectives. We want kids growing up loving nature. And if kids don't have the opportunity to experience nature, then they're not going to grow, grow mm. up loving it. And when it's their yeah. turn in charge, yeah. they're not going to be making yeah. decisions to, to look after it so it is it's really really important to what we do so here's the question what do you have for them to keep them oh interested? gosh right okay where do i start <laughs> um so from pond dipping which is a classic everybody loves pond dipping at age 38 and a half i still love going out on pond dipping it's still you my don't favorite look a day over 37. <laughs> thank you <laughs> but it's still you know it's an it's a real tried and tested activity that everybody loves and you'd get a lot of people come in because they did it as kids so that's a real uh, real a real key activity regular trails our new wild play area as well to really try and mimic some of those childhood experiences that that me and you may have had yeah. uh, growing up you know playing in streams climbing trees we're kind of mimicking that with our uh, secret water zone and our our tower um, that you can climb up and get amazing views because ultimately if you don't grow up experiencing these things, you're not going to want. You're not going to care about it as a grown-up. So. You, you've you've actually worked out one good way of getting children here because you do a lot of work with schools and societies, don't you? We do, yeah. So we get somewhere between two and two and a half thousand school children through every year, um, and of course we do as well as those kind of formal school visits we get a lot of uniformed groups as well things like scouts and brownies yeah. beavers and, and girl guides which is yeah. it's wonderful it really is there's nothing quite like having a group of children come and seeing their face light up when they see something new or you know they discover something or they discover how wonderful nature is it's, there's, there's there's nothing quite as rewarding as that balancing visitors across the wildlife is there a bit of a conflict of interest? Do you know, we are really lucky here. Um, I know in some areas um, there, there can be issues. Um, here at Old Moor, we're very lucky, I should say. Um, we're a, the, this is a site that we're able to very easily control the visitor flow. Um, we have our paths, our path network, which it's incredible actually wildlife really quickly learns that people go here that means that this is the place for and me this bit is yeah, us. yeah and then the people don't come here so that's fine um so you do see um sometimes you'll see bird nests really close to paths right. um but because they know that the people are there and this yeah. is the safe place for them well, on some of our satellite sites there's there's a bit more of an issue there mm. can be that kind of um a butting of of of, of people and nature Unfortunately, some of our sites we suffer with uh, antisocial behaviour, etc., etc. We know we're not we're not immune to that. Um, so it is something that we try to manage with things like fencing and ditches and, and yep. that kind of things. Try to put those physical barriers in place. But you know, it's it's something we we struggle with and we try to manage as best as we can. One one thing that I'd never thought to ask before I came here, but you're 
wonderfully well equipped for, for, for non-ambient people. By mm. that, I mean wheelchairs. In fact, you look as if you've got yourself a fleet of wheelchairs here. <laughs> so one of the things that is quite an ambition of the RSPB, and I think we at Oldmore, we do it okay. We, we do it okay, um, but is to make nature accessible across the piece. Yeah. Um, so we do, we're, we're lucky we have um, a, a, a few um, motorised scooters here um, that we, we loan out free of charge. Um, we do try, our path network is, is wide with regular places for people to pause and rest um, and our hides, we try to, we've tried to make sure all the doors are wide enough to, to, for buggies, mum, mums and buggies, yes. but also people yeah. that do have issues with mobility. Essentially nature is for everybody, so we try to remove as many of those barriers. If somebody needs to come with a carer, the carer will yeah. get free entry, that kind of thing. We, we're trying. We're not perfect, but we are trying. <laughs> <laughs> aiming for it. Well, talking about that and aiming for things, mm -hmm. uh, what about the future? How positive are you about it? And I'm not going to ask you for ideas because that will be stealing, will not it? <laughs> but, but how do you see the future developing? Well, here at Oldmore, I think we've got a really rosy future. Um, we have just been awarded the Triple SI status for um, for the Dern Valley, which means that a lot of uh, a lot of our work and our um, our land is now protected under that. Yeah. Um, Triple SI being site of special type scientific does, interest. Does, it, does, does it run in my mind that it helps you get grants too? Um, it can. Mm. The main thing is is around the. It, the land is protected. It means yeah. it's really, yeah. really hard um, for people to, to develop and, and, and things you like that. You can't suddenly build a big house exactly. somewhere. Exactly. So, well, it's only at the corner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, we, you know, we are, we have been really lucky to have um, to got a, a, a very, very generous National Lottery Heritage Fund grant, which means that we're able to develop. Um, more of our family offer and also do some quite substantial bits of habitat work um, that, that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. So it's only getting better, um, which means it's better for wildlife and it's better for people. And, and that for me means that more people can come and experience wildlife here and nature and get that connection and really, and really love where they live and um, it means that we'll be attracting more people from out, uh, outside of the area as well which is always good for the local economy as well exactly. you know and um, because we will be more and more a wildlife destination as well. Lydia do you love your job? I love my job yeah I really do I'm very very I mean look at my office you know um, I'm very very fortunate I'm um, I'm I'm paid to do what I love, and that, I, I appreciate I'm in a very fortunate position. Your hobby becomes your job, and that's a wonderful that's, place well, to be in, isn't it? Exactly. You never work a day in your life if your hobby becomes your job. <laughs> Lydia, it's been great talking to you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. And take care, and uh, thank you again. Thanks very much. This was, not long ago, a huge derelict industrial site. It's now a beacon of wildlife preservation thanks to Barnsley Council and the long-term development work of the RSPB. Emma Tuckey is the site manager and I asked her what had been achieved here and what the future was likely to be. Well, it's been a busy couple of years since I've been here um, with the pandemic. <laughs> but besides that, um, the challenge is for the site really are uh, uh, just making sure that we've got enough supporters um, to support what we do and make sure that we've got support throughout into the future but also that we're financially viable so that we can do the conservation work that we're required to do yeah. to make the spectacle and the habitat so wonderful. Yeah. Is there anything that might put it in jeopardy? Absolutely, if we, if we didn't get enough um, membership supporters we wouldn't be able to do the conservation work day to day that we do here to make the habitat so wonderful. Um, we've recently become a triple SI uh, nature reserve. Yes, um, they, 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 they're a sort of double-edged sword aren't they because some people absolutely want to embrace them while other people are saying no we don't want that and suddenly a fight sort of breaks out between two really nice organisations. Yeah, we definitely support the triple SI here, it will support um, the work that we do and it will mean that locally in the valley we'll have um, better sort of uh, support for like planning applications making yeah. sure nature's factored in making yeah. sure our 
uh, critical species are supported throughout the valley, not just here at Old Moor. Right. So, in other words, by, by being an SSSI, you, it allows you access to other funding to keep it going. It definitely does, and it makes our uh, current funding applications stronger because um, it, it just means that we're more significant of a nature reserve so that when we're putting in an ask to funders, we can say we're not just a wetland, we're an internationally important wetland for these birds that come here. Yeah, I, I hate to say it, but whenever it uh, is nature, birds, fish, whatever, in the end, it boils down to government, both national and local, doesn't it? Do you see any problems? I mean, is your funding safe? Uh, funding is never safe, unfortunately, but um, there is some funding coming through from the government about the Green Recovery Fund, which the RSVB is accessing, which is a huge help in our sector. But the lack of kind of EU funding is a, is a risk, and we are worried about it. Um, locally, we've got we've got setups where we've got our kind of the business side of the um, the setup here, the cafe and the shop and the membership, which will help us be financially viable here at Oldmore. But we need support wider than that. Um, it's not just RSBB; that's the whole conservation sector. Yeah, I seem to be very doom laden with this. But what's climate change mean to you? You see, I see all these wonderful. <coughs> British plants, if I can call them that, are they going to be in danger? I mean, yeah. if they'll burn quite well in other countries, I should imagine they'll burn here. Could you, could you see us losing it? Yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a risk due to climate change. I think one of the most um, realistic elements for us is increased likelihood of flooding in the valley. And most of our Durham Valley sites are flood um, flooded areas. Flood areas. They're designed to flood, they're designed to hold water back from the river catchment to protect housing downstreams. But the more that happens, the more our wetlands are underwater and um, the more they're impacted long term. But um, that's the balance that we have to make here. I notice you've got feeding boxes for some, certainly some of the birds. Um, is that deliberate policy so that the birds will come down while you have people here? Yeah, it's part of our kind of spectacle. So if we if we draw the birds into our feeders, it means that the visitors have a, a really good experience when they're here and they can get closer to nature uh, and understand more about the reserve here. So they can see that we have bullfinches and um, tree sparrows and all sorts of different things that they might not see without those feeders bringing them a bit closer to the to the viewers, the visitors. And then they can understand better why we're here, what, why we're making these conservation asks and asking for um, membership supporters, because they can see the wildlife in front of them as we brought them closer to those birds. Finally, though, are you enjoying your job and how much? I really am enjoying the job. The, the site here is just beautiful. Um, and the team is fantastic. And it's a real pleasure to come to work every day. Oh, that's nice to hear. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, that was Emma Tucky, the site manager here at Old Moor. Now the final person to talk to on my visit is Spike Mayston, who is a visitor experience manager at Old Moor. Spike, you've been making quite a few changes around here recently, haven't you? In fact, since last night I came here, there's a new footpath. There's a new footpath, there's new visitor facilities, there's uh, <clears throat> more importantly, you know, uh, some of the habitat improvements uh, are all, all happening now. Yeah. Uh, why a footpath in particular? Was it, was it something that was needed or something just to put the icing on the cake? Well, we've known for a long time that uh, RSPB Elmore, you know, have been quite reliant on hides, you know, uh, where, where, where the visitor has an opportunity to see uh, some of the wildlife. Uh, but they are, uh, you know, with, with the new footpath, this offers a really good sort of like panoramic view over some of the, 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 the wetlands yeah. here at RSPB Elmore, yeah. Which a lot of people who come here would really appreciate wouldn't it? yeah yeah and it's it's really been highlighted uh, how hide reliant we 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 have been uh through covid in fact you know so yeah. so during covid it, it, at the back end of covid we opened up our doors to our visitors of course we've got nowhere to go because uh you, you know the restrictions of that that tight, tough yeah. they couldn't use the hide so so yeah yeah the the, the new footpath is is a welcomed addition to the uh, uh to the reserve yeah um 
it's been successful in bringing visitors in and when I say visitors, I just don't, I don't mean the human kind. I mean the feathered and swimming and flying type. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, we got, uh, you, you know, this Dern Valley is really, really important throughout the year, you know. So, uh, one, it's a migratory stop off uh, point. Uh, uh, two, uh, we have birds that are over winter here, you know, and we still got some yeah. birds like teal and widgeon that are still here at the moment. <clears throat> you know, this this side, you know, this uh, where well, we are, the, the third of Mar third weekend of March. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, we have breeding here. You know, some of the habitat improvement works here is to sort of like increase the productivity of of birds, and by that I mean uh, bums on eggs. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, a, a large part of the reserve here is being converted from uh, what we call uh, wet grasslands uh, to wader scrape uh, to improve that. And next point I was coming to, you've got a new scrape, haven't you? Yeah, well, it's not quite uh, completed yet. Um, the vast majority of the, the footpath is open um, uh, now, uh, but the the actual um, the the. Uh, the wader scrape uh, isn't quite ready yet um, because we've had to sort of like stop because of breeding season. You know, it's critical that we don't interrupt. Yeah, that. Yes, they like privacy, don't they? Like they like one. they like <laughs> privacy, yeah. And uh, and and wildlife has a tendency, you know, uh, once it's disturbed to go, uh, yeah. and it's very difficult to get it back. You know, so we're very sensitive. I, I'm interested in the birds that sort of lodge here temporarily on the way from A to B they stop here and then fly on uh, yeah yeah so uh, we've um, you know uh, migrate the UK is a hub when it comes to sort of like migration yeah. it's massively massively important you know there's migrations from um, uh, you know Europe uh, but also migrations uh, from Siberia yeah. uh, those regions and of course you know we still get the odds you know even where we are now uh, migratory birds that are perhaps uh, you, you come over from the, the Atlantic you know so so it's extremely important I mean some of the the, the, the common ones um, uh, would be uh, the wintering birds like teal and widgeon um, you know where, where they, they, they come here to overwinter uh, and, and, and feed on um, on seed heads and this is like their destination this is yeah it? that's right in the winter then they go off to uh, other parts of uh, yeah of, of the world to, uh, yes. to, to breed you know <laughs> and like you know at the same time we have uh, uh, birds that come here during the summer you know uh, uh, to breed so our sister reserve uh, mm -hmm. over attic there and there's uh, last year there's something like 18 breeding pairs of avocets and a yeah oh well, yeah but the rspb uh, uh, logo there that's that's an avocet um I, they, they, I think there's like three breeding pairs at Old Moor last year, and some of the habitat improvement works will go even even beyond, you know, these breeding numbers um, uh, uh, to get more breeding avocet here, more breeding red shank here. So, so yes, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's good. Uh, do you think you might get so successful that you have a conflict of interest? When I say conflict of interest, will you start banning foxes? Well, and if so, I don't know what fox language there is to say. Please don't come in here. That's that's a difficult thing to, yeah. to ban foxes. But what we do is we do put systems in place uh, to prevent um, disturbance mm. by foxes, and we yeah. call it predator fencing. You know, the, it, it does what it says and on the tin. And then with the water, there's and weasels, with, and, with, and with the ditch, <laughs> and you know, and so there are systems in place to. Uh, to prevent that type of uh, uh, predation, but no, I mean, you, you know, uh, we, we, we try and sort of like uh, counter any sort of like yeah, uh, yeah. effect. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've got some great news, recent news in the Dern Valley, uh, especially here at RSPB on Moor. Otters are back, you know, after a long, long time of not being in our river systems. What a of, success! Oh, absolutely, yeah. We're all thrilled to bits here, in, you know, in the Dern Valley. So there are, there's been one or two sort of like indications, um, you know, over the last couple of years that they may sort of like uh, be looking to, to come back in this neck of the woods. Ah, family groups <coughs> and breeding it, again. It, it, it certainly looks that way, yeah. So, um, you know, it's not, we can't quite confirm it yet, but it's, it's likely that we may have... Uh, a female and last year's pup, so so yeah, it's, yeah, we're all excited here, and, and you know, it's, it's testimony to the health of the river systems, you know, uh, to uh, you know the the, the the environment agency and 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 places like this yeah. in the Dern Valley, you know, some of the habitat restoration. 
I hope that Spike Mayston's project goes well and provides an extra area for the wildlife and an extra interest for visitors. The Dern Valley is a great success story of renewal and nature conversation and a truly great place to visit for all ages. Together with all the people who work to support them, Old Moor and the other sites contribute to the richness of the environment and our well-being. Most have been magically created out of the decay and dereliction and they remind us that the planet Earth is infinitely renewable. If human beings would like to give it a chance. Mm -hmm.